Today's GovLove episode is brought to you by Citizen Lab, an online community engagement platform for local governments. Forget about juggling multiple tools. With Citizen Lab, you can streamline your community engagement projects. It's easy to use and backed by Citizen Lab's team of experts who are dedicated to supporting uh, you and your team. Their all-in-one platform makes engagement easier. You can learn more by going to citizenlab.co. That's citizenlab.co. Hey, y'all. Coming to you from Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, this is GovLove, a podcast about local government brought to you by engaging local government leaders. I'm Ben Kittleson, senior consultant at Raf Tellus and GovLove co-host. Uh, we've got a great episode for you today. Um, we're going to be talking about ocean protection efforts in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, but first, the best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGO member. Uh, engaging local government leaders is a professional association engaging the brightest minds in local government. And mark your calendars. Our annual conference is coming this fall, October 13th to 14th in Phoenix, Arizona. And tickets are on sale now. And if you uh, register now, you'll get the lowest price. So go ahead and go to elgl.org slash elgl22 um, to, to find out more. That's uh, elgl.org uh, slash elgl uh, and the number is 22. Now, let me introduce today's guest. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Wise West is the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the city of Santa Cruz, California a position she's been in since 2016. Uh, she's a licensed professional engineer with over 25 years of experience in environmental planning, policy, and infrastructure project design and management. Uh, Dr. Wise West, uh, welcome to GovLove. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Cool. Well, uh, we have a tradition on the podcast to uh, do, do a lightning round, so some fun questions to help you warm up and let our listeners get to know you. Um, so my, my first question for you, uh, what was the first concert that you went to? Rick Springfield in Cleveland, Ohio. Nice. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So, um, what was your my next uh, lightning round question? What was your what is your most controversial non political opinion? This one I think was really hard for me to identify. I think I'm just going to say I don't eat a lot of meat, and I get a lot of questions about that. Are you like full, like vegetarian, vegan, or like uh, just try to avoid it? I'm not. I just typically eat fish and chicken. And, um, you know, we have an amazing food scene out here and game is really popular and I'm not up for game meat. So it comes up sometimes. I guess it could be political too. So I hope it fits your definition. No, I think that works. Some some people say like, is there any non political opinion? <laughs> but that gets a little too heady for me. <laughs> True. Um, okay, my next linear question: uh, What what book are you reading? Reading. Well, I just finished this amazing book called uh, "The Firekeeper's Daughter" by Angeline Bouley. It's um, it's a, centers around a, a indigenous young woman and uh, who essentially mm-hmm. needs to go undercover to protect her, um, her land and her, and her, uh, her community. Very cool to put that on my, on my list. It's a young adult book. All right, and and then my last... Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes those are the best ones. They're, you know, easy reads and tackle some big questions. So, exactly. <laughs> um, awesome. So, my last line of question for you, where do you go for inspiration? You know, I'm so lucky here um, in Santa Cruz. I do one of two things. I either head to the ocean, which is only a couple blocks away, or I head into the mountains and go hiking, which is just a couple miles away. So two great ways um, to get inspiration here. Yeah, very lucky to... <laughs> Mountains and and sea. That's uh, <laughs> very jealous. Oh, cool. So it's kind of a way to to start our um, our conversation. I always like to hear how folks kind of ended up in local government and kind of what their career path to this this field was. Um, so for you, um, what was kind of your path into local government? Where did you, you know, how did you end up at the city of Santa Cruz? Yes. Well, my entire career has actually focused on local government, whether it's it was in consulting, working for the city itself, 
Um, and believe it or not, my first kind of exposure to local government was in high school. I got voted the water commissioner at your municipal government, you know, students at the municipal government day. And it really, going to the water treatment plant really got me thinking about, um, you know, municipal infrastructure. And it was very interesting to me, like how water came in raw and was drinkable when it came out. And from there, um, you know, got an environmental engineering, civil engineering degree, did a lot of water, wastewater, solid waste, stormwater engineering for the first 12 years of my career. And then got very interested in green buildings, renewable energy. Um, I had been doing consulting work that whole time for local governments. So, um, you know, had already had exposure from one kind of aspect. Um, went to grad school after that first 12 years and really pivoted into climate and sustainability, getting a PhD in environmental studies. And at that time, my dissertation work focused on a piece of municipal infrastructure, which is um, a small offshore wind turbine. And it actually is the only wind turbine off the coast of California that's permitted by the California Coastal Commission. It's on our municipal wharf that extends about a half mile out. And so um, I started working with the city again on permitting and, and doing some technical integration and some studies um, that ultimately ended up com comprising my dissertation work. And from there, I continued to work with the city um, as a, a temp worker doing community, community engagement on climate, um, as a consultant doing greenhouse gas emissions inventory for the city, and ultimately um, coming into this position as the sustainability and climate action manager about six years ago. Incidentally, I did also work for the city um, as a water engineer about 20 years ago. So that was my first dip into working for a local government um, versus being a consultant for local government. So lots of, uh, lots of work in municipal government over the past 25 years or so. Very cool. Well, and what a great sales pitch for, you know, why local governments do those little um, uh, career days or bring bring school kids in to see facilities right. because it can inspire a whole a whole <laughs> career. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. So that wind turbine, so it, it's, 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 it's still, you said that's still the only one in California and is it, can you just talk, what, how did that come about and like kind of is that part of your, I, I assume, still part of kind of the city's, you know, climate action and, and sustainability kind of work? Yes. Yes, it is. So how that came about, um, you know, currently in California, we have no offshore wind. It, it's not developed here mm -hmm. yet. Um, we're working on it. And this is obviously a unique case because it's mounted on a wharf. But um, one of my research groups, which was uh, the Center for uh, Sustainable Energy and Power Systems, um, was looking to pilot um, this wind turbine at the wharf. They had a great degree of interest from the wharf supervisor at the time, who was um, uh, an alumni of uh, UC Santa Cruz, um, where the center was located. And it came together through a memorandum of understanding, through some grant funding, through some graduate student work, which is largely mine. Um, fortunately, I had um, in my engineering career uh, a background in being able to do permitting um, of infrastructure, particularly in the coastal zone, which is obviously where we reside and there are special special requirements for that. And um, had the working electrical engineering background to be able to help with the technical integration and then spread my wings a bit further by doing uh, a study of bird impacts, which was, you know, really kind of outside of my, um, my kind of technical engineering background, more in obviously ecology, which um, my uh, grad program was very interdisciplinary. And then also doing um, uh, institutional analysis of the permitting regime and contrasting it with um, that in Denmark, which essentially built the small-scale wind turbine um, market. 
Um, and so from there, um, continued to do a number of projects at the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. We call it the Green Wharf. It's an eco district. Um, and it certainly is a showcase for us. Um, we have uh, solar street lamps. We have fully upgraded street lamps to LED uh, technology. We have um, businesses that are green business certified um, and so forth. So it's really been a, a wonderful test bed, so to speak. And we're working on something now that's under wraps, but very exciting um, that we hope to bring forward as our next um, innovative pilot as part of the Green War. Oh, what a tease. That's good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. We'll to... <laughs> Check back in we'll, six We'll months. have to stay tuned, I guess. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Um, yeah. And what a... What a way to show how diverse Silk Road would be. You, you get in working in water and now you're you know, studying bird ecology as part of the project. Absolutely. Um, and the power of collaboration. So, like, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, for maybe folks that are unfamiliar with Santa Cruz or you know, have, haven't been out your way yet, um, and we've, I feel like we've got a little bit of a sense of it, but what else should folks know about kind of the city or the area um, that might inform maybe some of the, the climate action work that y'all do? Or um, So yeah, what else, what else should we know about the city of Santa Cruz? Definitely. So we are um, a small, medium-sized city of about 65,000 people. Um, we have about four miles of coastline. We are situa situated about 70 miles south of San Francisco on what's called the Monterey Bay. Um, and as I mentioned, we're also nestled up against the Santa Cruz mountain range. Um, notably, we are very closely located to Silicon Valley. So the whole tech sphere is definitely part of our ecosystem here. And I would say definitely touches into our climate work um, on multiple levels and allows us to do some innovating, which is really great. And also to learn from, you know, not only technologists, but also our local government peers. Um, and Santa Cruz, um, the motto is keep Santa Cruz weird. It is a very eclectic um, uh, area with, I, I would say, a, um, a fairly diverse population. Um, we do have our share of challenges with respect to climate. Um, we are very prone to sea level rise and intensified coastal storms. We do have a low-lying frontline community called the Beach Flats um, that we're particularly concerned about. Um, we also, um, obviously here in California, we deal with drought quite a bit. Um, so water supply is certainly an issue uh, for from a climate standpoint. And then of course, there are a multitude of other issues um, related to wildfire, um, Landslide, obviously, we're concerned about tsunami and earthquake, which um, not necessarily climate uh, causes, but um, can be influenced by, by uh, climate. So there's just a little bit about Santa Cruz. It's a great place to live. Unfortunately, it's becoming more and more unaffordable, um, which is impacting the diversity mm. um, that we have here. Um, something that's really happening, I think, especially here in California and coastal cities. Um, but that's a little bit about Santa Cruz. Yeah, very cool. Um, uh, and in terms of kind of your guys' climate action program, um, can you maybe talk a little bit about, I don't, I don't know if you have a team or, <laughs> but what kind of, kind of guides your work and kind of, I know we'll talk more about maybe some of the, the plans and uh, other stuff that you guys have, um, some more specifics, but just kind of generally maybe what guides your work and like how big your team is and how you can maybe work with other folks in the city. Absolutely. So you, you nailed it. I collaborate quite closely with everyone across the city and with our community itself. My team really comprises of myself um, and I have a half-time uh, management analyst um, or climate analyst, as, as really her position is called, who works with me and a team of interns and consultants that work with me. Um, so very, very small program. Um, However, even here in California, it is still somewhat unique to have a dedicated person on climate and sustainability. Many smaller jurisdictions don't, or they're just kind of ramping up a program like this. Our program is in the city manager's office. 
um, which I think is is a really good thing. It shows our commitment of the city. I think um, that climate, uh, you know, is integrated throughout our organization. Um, Mm -hmm. And we have really great leadership on climate change with our city council, our city manager, um, who really support the work we're doing and support us to be innovative and to push ahead on many fronts. Um, So that's uh, a little bit about our program. Very cool. A small but mighty team. That's Small but mighty. (laughs) And, And the program was established in... 2007 or 2008, which was really early um, for local government to establish such a program. You also asked me what guides our work. We have really two overarching guiding documents. One is our climate action plan, and the second is our climate adaptation plan. And um, developing, maintaining, and implementing those plans really are the focus of our work. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I read that that um, that cl- original climate action plan um, is from 2012 or so. So, um, can you can you talk about mm-hmm. maybe the progress made on that original plan? And, and I know you're working on an update too. So, what what kind of where are you at in in that process? Absolutely, yeah. So that first climate action plan, as you said, was adopted in uh, 2012. It contained 12 climate milestones or or um, goals and 254 actions um, that would Hmm. help us to achieve those goals, each of which have had targets. That plan sunset in 2020, um, we were able to meet, and I should say that a lot of those, those goals that were set up, those 12 goals were really ambitious in nature, really reflecting, I think, the values of our community. Our community is incredibly environmentally minded, and we only achieved a handful of them. But we made a lot of progress uh, to set ourselves up for where we are now um, in developing this uh, 2030 plan, now that the 2012 plan sunset in 2020. We've been working on our new plan um, for over a year. Um, In our 2012 plan, I would say some of our biggest successes um, were um, with respect to bringing online and being one of the leading agencies to stand up what's called Central Coast Community Energy, which is our community choice aggregator. Um, And for those of you that don't know what that is, that Uh, There is enabling legislation in California and 10 other states in the U.S. that allow um, joint powers authorities, so so legal groups, to take over the procurement of their electricity from the investor-owned utility utilizing their distribution and transmission line. And we wanted to do that because then we could ramp up our procurement of renewable energy and with the profit margin that the IOUs get, we could develop programs for building electrification, transportation electrification, and fund them. And so the promise of you know, higher renewable content, in fact, by 2030, 100% renewable content, and the investment in our community um, was a big win for us um, and allowed us to really draw down our emissions. Um, uh, over since it came online in 2018. So that is, I would say, one of the biggest successes that came out of the 2012 plan and, in fact, factors very heavily in um, our new plan that will be adopted in August, I'm excited to say. Um, I can certainly share some of the areas of focus. So because that 100% yeah. renewable energy, we have um, some focus on building electrification We have, in fact, already adopted a natural gas prohibition in new construction, and we're working on our existing building electrification roadmap right now. So that factors into our climate action plan, as does really the most important sector for us. 69% of our emissions come from transportation. And while electrification of our fleets, of our personal vehicles and commercial vehicles is important, We also need to make big gains in um, active transportation, walking and biking, 
and modest gains in public transportation, which has been really challenging here in Santa Cruz. Um, mm. And then there's uh, also around waste, um, a, a big focus. We also um, highlight equity. Um, we have really, um, we're compensating some equity advisors, um, a dozen of them actually throughout this process to ensure that not just our process is fair and equitable, but that our outcomes are reflected. Um, and so we developed an equity screening tool that we applied to every stage of this plan to ensure that we really are um, bringing forward the needs of historically underrepresented and underserved folks as the highest priority of this plan while achieving emissions uh, reductions. So there's a bit about our plan. Um, very excited uh, to launch it. Um, it will have a community activation platform where folks can get up-to-date knowledge serving kind of as a hub for where folks can find the rebates that are out there for your e-bike or, hey, what, what should I be doing about my purchasing and those kinds of things. And then also a public facing sustainability dashboard to really, you know, not just have a once a year update, but allow folks to really see where we are in real time. So a lot of exciting work um, that's happened. And then we were really already implementing the plan. Um, we're doing some fleet electrification work. We just electrified um, our first refuse um, trucks. That's super exciting. And just have a number of other energy related yeah. things underway. Yeah, electrifying those heavy trucks. That's the that's where you can really make a difference in some of those emissions, right? Um, You're right. That, that's a, You're the right. bulk of most organizations, fleets, yeah. Yeah, if you can overcome those um, charging, uh, you know, the infrastructure can be expensive and complex. But um, yeah, we're, again, this is another example of our city council really pushing the city to adopt, be early adopters for something mm -hmm. like an electric refuse truck. And so I'm very excited to, uh, as our, you know, solid waste division um, integrates it into their fleet and, uh, you know, we continue to learn and, and expand on, on what we know and expand on our fleet electrification plans. Very cool. Awesome. So, and we'll be sure to link to, to your website and, um, I know you've got a landing page for kind of updates on the, the climate action plan. So we'll, we'll link to that so folks can learn more. Thank you. Um, but one of the things I wanted to be sure to ask you about was, uh, you know, I read you guys were recently recognized as a, as a blue city, and I'm forgetting the organization that did it. I didn't write it down, but um, <laughs> for Santa Cruz's commitment to healthy oceans and waterways. So, I, you know, I, I think that's kind of a, obviously, we, you know, you mentioned at the top, like being on the coast and, um, you know, being susceptible to sea level rise, that's going to drive some of the climate uh, work in, in Santa Cruz. So what are some of the initiatives you'll, you'll have around ocean protection and water quality that um, that the city is doing. Yes, absolutely. There are so many. Um, so Blue City, Blue City certification, it's a new cert certification process by Project O, which is a 501c3 mm -hmm. ocean conservation organization. And so we joined eight other cities here in California um, to demonstrate that we are leaders um, in uh, ocean protection. There was uh, an 80 question uh, survey that we had to take to see where we were in that process. And so really it, it looks at, uh, you know, what are we already doing as a city? What are our partners doing um, in the community? And really acknowledging all that everyday work that we're doing. Some of the things um, that were highlighted included our Cowell working group. So Cowell Beach is one of our main beaches down in our tourist area. And um, we were having water quality issues at that beach, um, landing on what's called the, the beach bummer list here in California. And <laughs> um, it really took a coalition of partners, not just the city, but surf nonprofits and other folks that were concerned about the ocean to come together and do some studies and figure out what the issue is there. And we fortunately landed ourselves off the beach bummer list for the first time in probably a dozen years. Um, so that was a really big accomplishment um, that I think got recognized through this Blue City certification. 
But we have other things. For example, we have a ban on styrofoam. We have a ban on reusable plastic bags. Um, you need to bring your own bags. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was driven by um, marine wildlife protection, you know, entanglements mm -hmm. with bags and so forth. We ha also have a an ordinance uh, in place uh, putting a charge on single-use um, uh, products like cups and things like that that also end up sometimes in our in our um, ocean and marine habitat. Um, we also have done quite a bit of work um, planning, well, understanding our vul vulnerabilities and planning for sea level rise. Um, and that is mm -hmm. through our Resilient Coast Santa Cruz initiative and most recently our West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan that was adopted in 2021. Um, so there are a few highlights. I am certainly not mentioning the majority of them, um, which again gets to some of our day-to-day -day work and how we maintain our ocean, uh, or rather our beach um, and our adjacent um parks and uh, green spaces and roadways and so forth um, using, you know, low impact um, kind of uh, materials and methods and so forth. So, yeah, it was quite an honor um, for our city to, to be recognized in this way. Yeah, yeah. And, and congrats. That is a <laughs> that's very cool. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, yeah. And so you mentioned kind of the adaptation and, and planning for sea level rise. So what, what does that actually like look like when it, you comes down to, I don't know, are you taking a look at like building codes? Is it st stormwater management? Is it, what, what is kind of, is it, you know, creating more seawalls? Like what, what does planning for sea level rise look like? Um, like when it comes down to like actual implementation and things that the city can kind of control? Absolutely. Well, of the things that you mentioned, it's almost an all of the above. Um, a lot of yeah. our time over the past few years has really been characterizing our risks, making sure we understand where um, there are vulnerabilities, not just in infrastructure, but for people as well, as well as habitat and so forth. Um, but in these planning documents that we have produced, there is <clears throat> policy as well as infrastructure focusing on the near term. You know, we, we, our planning process looked out towards the end of the century, towards 2100. Mm -hmm. And we use this approach called adaptation pathways because there's a lot of uncertainty about the rate of sea level rise. Are we going to get our emissions mm -hmm. under control so that it might be slowed? Or are we on a fast track tra trajectory? We just don't exactly know. But using adaptation pathways, we rely instead on triggers. They could be physical triggers, social triggers. And when those tr triggers each has a threshold, when the threshold is exceeded, then we know to transition to the next adaptation strategy. So I'll give you an example. Huh. Down on Main Beach, right now, we have a very short curb wall. And that's about it. Um, we know that during king tides, our entire beach is inundated. And so, and it gives us a really good indication of what future sea level rise might look like. But what we have called out as, okay, there, if beach width is narrowed to a less than 100 feet three times in a summer season, we know that this is a situation that necessitates we transition to a next step strategy, in which case we would look at what about a living shoreline application? Could we do a vegetated dune? Hmm. What kind of protection would that afford while simultaneously updating our stormwater systems, ensuring that they can handle any added capacity and if there's connectivity um, to the ocean? while also looking at how can we adapt or accommodate uh, structures, perhaps by elevating them. It, hmm. With the longest term is moving back from the ocean, um, so retreating from the ocean. Yeah. But I'm sure you've had folks on your, um, your podcast before who've talked about the fact that we really are just starting to initiate those conversations um, about those kinds of hard choices that will need to be made in the future, 
And we're really, really setting the stage for people to have some agency over understanding in a really easy kind of way um, what we're projecting, what the possible viable options are, and really what are the conditions under which we would go to them. We have been using um, virtual reality. <clears throat> we have, and I would love to um, direct your, your listeners to um, the Santa Cruz Sea Level Rise Explorer app that we developed with our technology partner, Virtual cool. Planet Technologies. Yeah, it's super cool. It allows you to um, envision what sea level rise might look like uh, along with coastal storm flooding um, over time. It allows you to actually adjust it and see what impacts and inundation might occur. And then it shows you a couple solutions and what solutions might look like and actually embeds a survey to ask preferences. And we utilize this quite a bit during our engagement. It really was an effective tool to take this kind of um, you know, ambiguous concept of climate change and sea level rise and make it really relevant uh, for Santa Cruz. And uh, that's one of our, you know, ways with technology um, that we have uh, really tried to um, capitalize on. And then lastly, right now, we're developing out a coastal change monitoring program so that we can actually monitor those triggers, things like beach width or rate of erosion, um, so that we know when to transition and start planning to, for these next step strategies. A lot yeah. to unpack. And it seems like having there. clear, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like having clear, like, this many times in a year, if this happens, we're going to the next step, makes it makes it easier to remember, like, I don't know, not that it's, it's so long of a time horizon necessarily, but makes it remember, like, hey, we're, we're not... We're not getting used to this new normal over time. We know that, like, when it hits this number, we need to do something else. Because um, I think it can be easy to say, "Hey, you know, king tides are just kind of the new normal," and that they <laughs> and that 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 sh maybe shouldn't be the case. Maybe we need to to adapt if that if that becomes something that's so common. So having those like measurable things to say, "Look, now we need to take an action." That seems yeah. like really smart. Absolutely. And we're hearing from our residents that they really like this approach that, hey, if these things don't mm -hmm. happen, we're not taking we're not making premature investments of taxpayer dollars, you know, that yeah. we're taking kind of this smart approach. And it's really resonated with a wide range of stakeholders who, in some cases in California, have held up planning processes that included, you know, discussion of things like pulling back from the coastline. So. Um, we're having some good success with that approach. And in fact, we're going to be applying it to all of our climate adaptation work when we start our update of our climate adaptation plan and local hazard mitigation plan uh, late this year. Very cool. Um, and I think you mentioned this maybe at the, the beginning of uh, your answer to the last question, but um, what is the West Cliff Drive adapt adaptation and, and management plan? I, mean, I think it stuck out to me because I was like, oh, a, a plan that it in, is that where public works is like one of the <laughs> in the title. Like uh, that, that, that. Tell me more. <laughs> so, yes. so what, what, yeah, what is that and, and what, what it's kind of the work that public works will be doing? Yeah. So this plan came out of this um, two, three year sea level rise initiative called Resilient Coast Santa Cruz. Really what it does is it specifies the next 12 years of investment that needs to be made into West Cliff Drive that um, really came out of this public process as well as you know technical feasibility. And when you, I said, it, to answer your other question, all of the above, it really contains quite a bit, including you know about half of our shoreline has armoring, big boulders or seawalls. And we are going to be bolstering the footprints of that existing armoring hmm. here in the near term. Probably the last time we'll get to do that as our um, local coastal authority is really encouraging um, a, a transition to a, a, a managed retreat or planned retreat over time in order to allow um, pocket beaches to migrate back. Um, you know, when we armor, we get that coastal squeeze on beaches. And of course, being a beach town, that's something we need to be concerned about. So we'll have a bit more of armoring. We have a bunch of transportation corridor improvements, including our bi-directional uh, bike and pedestrian pathway that is between the roadway and the, the bluff top edge. 
Um, so we have quite a bit called out for that. We have a master signage program. Um, we know that um, some of our, our local groups, including surfers, really are interested in putting some surf etiquette signage out. There's some older signage and there's some need for some new interpretive signage, including on sea level rise. Um, we also are going to be developing a master landscaping um, design standards and restoration plan. Um, hmm. We do have quite a bit of uh, what's called ice plant and it's non-indigenous and becomes very saturated and it actually accelerates the sloughing of the bluff tops. And so restoring with native vegetation, uh -huh. particularly that that can provide, you know, refuge and, and habitat um, is what we need to go to there as well. Um, and then lastly, we call out a number of studies. We do have several sea caves underlying West Cliff Drive that we will continue to monitor. We monitor every 10 years and we haven't seen any shifts in the, in the ones that we're um, primarily concerned about. We also want to look at sand management. You know, is it possible to, um, to deposit sand and allow it to uh, drift down coast and populate on some of our beaches that are getting hit and the sand washed away at more frequency and volume than in the past? Um, so that has some potential as well. Um, also living shoreline, uh, applications. How can we build in, you know, green infrastructure into say that seawall that we might replace? Is there a way to integrate yeah. bird roosts or, you know, other things so that we're providing habitat? So that's really what the plan calls for. I think I went through almost every category of project. Um, yeah. and then the monitoring of course that I mentioned, and that has a price tag of 20 million. So that's a big thing that I'm doing right now is trying to figure out how we're going to fund that plan. And, you know, we've, we already are implementing and have grants and other uh, revenue sources that we're evaluating right now. Wow. Very cool. So yeah, we'll have to, to link to that plan. So uh, folks can, can check out and learn more. Um, Cause yeah, that, uh, that's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. And um, awesome. I'd love to give you the link to the Resilient Coast Santa Cruz webpage because there's a lot of interesting yeah. stuff to explore there, including the links to the virtual reality sea level rise app. Yeah. Send, send that to me and we'll be sure we'll include in the notes for this, this episode. That's awesome. Sounds good. Um, and then uh, I, I read a little bit on your website about kind of initiatives around the green economy. Um, yes. And I think maybe there was like a, a round table that your mayor hosted. So can you talk maybe some about some of that? Because I feel like whenever this, the green economy gets brought up, it sounds very vague and, <laughs> and uh, like uncertain to me. So I, I'm just curious, what are some of the like actual things that, um, yeah. that are part of that? Absolutely. So this whole notion of the green economy actually came out during COVID as part of our recovery that our uh, city council really wanted us to <clears throat> focus on the green economy. We also had our climate action plan project starting. So it was a really kind of good dovetail because we had the ability through our climate action plan to put some kind of analytical capacity to this question. But in the meantime, the city uh, developed an internal and it actually became an external as well, uh, workforce development um, team um, that met. Really, we spent, I would say, eight months really listening and learning from folks like um, our labor unions, um, our workforce development board, our pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs, trying to look for some alignment. And we have found some alignment. In fact, let me just start by saying the green economy analysis of our climate action plan, just the top three measures, um, looks like over 20 years, there's going to be close to um, 4,000 jobs brought online just by implementing our climate action plan, which is really great. And so where we found alignment with a lot of our stakeholders when we we're doing these listening sessions is around a few things. Number one, electrification, building electrification and transportation electrification training. Um, <clears throat> we um, have already put in some grant proposals with some local partners for some low income um, green and healthy homes that would be electrifying homes and um, taking care of some health aspects with a workforce development aspect to it. 
Um, we also are looking at how can we increase pathways to municipal green jobs because there are a ton of them. Um, and we've been partnering with our county's, um, uh, our local community college's pre-apprenticeship program for building trades. Um, we are also looking very interested with the federal infrastructure bill in standing up a conservation corps for riparian river and coastal restoration work. Um, so those are some things that we are actively exploring. The pre-apprenticeship program is something we've supported and promoted. Um, we're also promoting, not just promoting, but participating in, um, a local nonprofit, Your Future is Our Business, um, by having folks come in shadow um, at the city. Um, and so we're, I would say we're still pretty early in this, you know, we've done the analytics, we've done the listening and the partnership building, we've started to do the grant funding, and now we're really, I think I'm looking for the right opportunities in grant funding to kind of ramp this up and really let's, you know, let's bring forward some meaningful jobs. And what's interesting is I've also been building this into say my coastal adaptation or coastal resilience grant proposals. Uh, for example, I have a tourism and climate change study and we pitched it so that we'd have a ton of funding to hire group uh, people from historically underrepresented groups are our frontline groups that are right in the kind of first line of of uh, sea level rise how we could bring hire them to come on to our leadership team help us plan our projects and then to go out and actually do the surveying for the tourism and climate change study and then come back and work with us on the analytics reports and we're kind of pitching that as a, a pilot uh, for workforce development. So we'll see if that that one gets funded in particular, but really looking for opportunities in the work that we're doing to to build these kinds of things into, into our work plans. Awesome. Very cool. All right. So well, um, that, that's probably a, a good transition to my, to my last question. What, what, what are things our, maybe our listeners should keep an eye out um, for that you're, you're working on or um, that, you know, they can, they can keep an eye out. Yeah. So we're fi finishing up this climate action plan. 2030 It's going to be adopted in August. We are in addition to grants because grants aren't going to solve everything. Um, we are also looking to mobilize <laughs> philanthropy. Um, we really don't have a lot of giving in our region. So um, we're going to be looking at a new giving program for philanthropy and climate, as well as leveraging private sector partners like tech startup Climatize to do micro lending for localized climate projects, particularly in frontline neighborhoods. Super excited about that. We have our coastal change monitoring program getting built out, both the social triggers that we're going to be developing, things like, you know, number of homes that got mold as a result of flooding, you know, things like that. Um, and then building out the technology aspects of our coastal change monitoring program. And then lastly, I'd say we're going to be starting our adaptation plan and local hazard mitigation plan update later this year. So lots coming out of the climate action program, but really lots coming out of the city. There are a lot of implementers across the city mm -hmm. besides myself. Um, I'm just mentioning a few things under my direct area. But as I said, we have a lot of fleet electrification happening. Um, we have a ton of solar coming online locally. So um, just lots in the hopper. I'm very, I have to say, I am super excited that while climate change is very daunting, the funding that is coming from the infrastructure bill and from the California state budget is literally once in a generation kind of funding and it can be transformative. And it is my greatest desire and, and greatest um, effort to position Santa Cruz and the Monterey Bay region for that funding. And I hope everyone else across the country can also do so. <laughs> Awesome. That's so cool. All right. So um, things for our listeners to look out for. So we'll, we'll, we'll put links to some of that or what's active at least in, in, in the, the notes. And then the most hard hitting question I always ask, uh, and this is again, kind of our, a tradition on GovLove. If you could be the GovLove DJ, what song would you pick as the exit music for today's episode? You know, I was doing some work at my house over the weekend and I was living, listening to D-Light, Groove is in the Heart. 
I love that song. So how about that one? Perfect. Awesome. Well, that ends our episode for today. Uh, Dr. Wise West, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me and, and sharing your expertise and, and kind of the work going on in Santa Cruz. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Cool. And for our listeners, GovLove is brought to you by engaging local government leaders. And the best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGL member. You can reach us online at elgl.org slash GovLove or on Twitter at the handle at GovLove Podcast. Um, and subscribe to GovLove on your favorite podcast app. And if you're already subscribed, go tell a friend or colleague about this podcast. Help us spread the word that GovLove is the go-to place for local government stories. With that, thank you for listening. This has been GovLove, a podcast about local government. Dish, my sick attached wish. Sing it, baby.